thank you for coming to our latest uh, noon lecture, the last one of the year uh, at the City Council. By us, I mean the Virginia Foundation of the Humanities, which has been very proud to, to uh, sponsor this series. And we're especially, my name, by the way, is Bill Freeling. I'm a senior fellow at the uh, Foundation. Uh, and we're especially proud of our lecture today. Henry Weinseck uh, graduated with a fine degree from Yale University, and ever after he has eschewed uh, academic training and academic uh, positions. Uh, he instead follows in the tradition of my favorite uh, American historian, Henry Adams, uh, who devoted his life to, to writing instead of uh, to uh, teaching, as has Henry. Henry has written some wonderful books on Virginia houses, his two most Famous books are on the Hairston family and on George Washington and his slaves, books for which he has won three coveted uh, national uh, prizes. He's now turned his attention to Thomas Jefferson and slavery. Uh, and here the comparison with Henry Adams gets very interesting. Uh, Henry Adams wrote a marvelous uh, study of the age of uh, Jefferson in which he was rather critical of Mr. Jefferson. But in the, uh, in the tradition of his own period, he had very little to say about anything except white males. Uh, blacks, women, et cetera, do not appear in Henry Adams' wonderful pages. So here we have uh, the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> non-academic successor to Henry Adams now turning his attention to Jefferson and slavery uh, and doing uh, with, this, with this new material, so typical of the modern period of historians, things that Henry Adams couldn't. It's a great pleasure to turn you over to Henry Weinstein. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much for that very gracious and very complimentary introduction. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, this is the, uh, my book on Jefferson is the third book I've written about slavery, and it doesn't get any easier. Um, it gets harder, actually, uh, maybe because of the subject matter. Uh, Mr. Jefferson is someone I've always admired, and uh, the, the more deeply you get into him, I think that the more disturbing uh, things become. And that's one reason why this book has gone on far too long. I've, I think I've written it and rewritten it. I know I've written it at least twice. Um, and I was fortunate to have a, a fellowship up at the Jefferson Library at the International Center for Jefferson Studies. And um, often, I, after a, a half a day or so in the, in the archives and I, you know, feeling confused and baffled, I would take advantage of my privilege to go up to Monticello free of charge and walk around the top of the mountain and mingle with the, the tourists and listen to the questions and. Uh, hear what people had to say and just walk around the place and soak in that really intoxicating atmosphere. Uh, it, it is an intoxicating house. Um, and you sense the genius of, of, of the architect, the genius of the master who was really our Mozart uh, in, in, in so many ways. And um, I'm thinking of opening the book with an incident that actually happened on one of these days when I felt a tremendous amount of confusion, and I happened to fall in with a group of tourists who were taking the wonderful plantation life tours, um, where a guy takes you along Mulberry Row and uh, tells you about the lives of the of the working people there, of the of the enslaved people. Um, and uh, on this one one hot July afternoon, she began talking about a slave that this, the specialists at uh, Monticello were very familiar with, a man named Peter Fawcett, who was just a child when Jefferson died, and he was uh, auctioned off. Um, and he was he was auctioned off um, to a man to a master who promised to free him. Uh, and but the master broke that promise. And at that moment, as the as the guide was in the middle of the story. Suddenly the sky grew very dark, and a th the thunder boomed in the distance, and the mountain actually shook. And the guide looked around nervously and said that anybody who wanted to run to the tunnel under the house to be safe you know, could do that, but she was going to stand under the shelter next to the old gift shop uh, to com com con continue the story. And nobody moved. Everybody wanted to hear it. Uh, and she talked about how Fawcett had been sold, how he had uh, learned to read and write starting at, at Monticello, 
and then how he forged free papers that got his uh, sister out of, out of Virginia, how he ran away and was caught and was then d resolved to get free or die in the attempt and ran away again and was caught and brought back and then was taken in Richmond in handcuffs to the, tr the traitors to be disposed of. And then uh, he said something that really sort of riveted the, the, the crowd. He said, God raised up friends for me. Uh, and it, it turned out that people in Charlottesville heard that he was about to be sold, so they raised the money and they, uh, bought, they bought him in at the auction. And eventually he became free and he joined his family in Ohio. And the last, his, one of his final wishes was that he, he wanted to see Monticello again. So uh, he came back and as, an old, as a very old man and went to the places that he had known uh, in, his, in his childhood. Uh, and, then he, and then he went back to Ohio and died. And this story had a profound effect on, on the tourists because when they heard that after, his, um, his, the after, after Jefferson had sold him, that, that uh, Fawcett remained a slave for another 24 years, they actually gasped. Uh, the, because having learned about the character of this man, they couldn't understand how someone of that character, of that courage, that, that perseverance, and that religious faith could have been held in, uh, in, in slavery. And this was the kind of person uh, that Thomas Jefferson said was inferior and had no place in America. And so the question hung in the air, how could such people be held in slavery? It was an abomination, and it was a betrayal of the ideals that Jefferson, Jefferson stood for. And the question is, how could Jefferson not see it? Uh, and actually, he did. Um, it is no great secret that, when, that an important part of the declaration that Jefferson wrote went missing. But if you look at the section that Congress deleted, it will tell you a lot about Jefferson and the foulness that he saw in slavery. A loathsome system, he, a loathsome system, he called it, where a market where men should be bought and sold. Every summer, the slave ships made their landings along the James River, unloading their diminished cargoes, who suffered, as Jefferson wrote, miserable death in their transportation. Every vessel tossed overboard 20, 50, 100 corpses in its passage across the sea. Jefferson most likely learned of this shrinkage of inventory from his father-in-law, John Wales, who was one of the traders. Jefferson saw other miseries from the wharves. Grim coffles of chained Africans were marched by the traders into the interior and offered for sale to planters and speculators who were vying for land and labor in a mad scramble of grab, 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 a, a quotation from the old line historian Douglas Saldell Freeman, a Virginian not known for his radical uh, views. Uh, when Jefferson courted the beautiful Martha Wales, he spent evenings by the fire, knee to knee with her father, old John, who talked business with the young suitor, discoursing on slaves in the peaks and valleys in the market for them. Old John had six children with one of his slaves, Betty Hemings. Precisely what Jefferson's own father did with his slaves is not entirely known, but Jefferson said that sons learn cruelty to slaves from their parents, so we get some idea. The world these fathers made revolted Jefferson as the traders and planters thrust what Peter Onuf calls a captive nation into Virginia. Lawyers such as the young Jefferson saw the incoming tide of slaves washing up against every county courthouse. Slaves were auctioned on courthouse steps. And every late summer and fall, the lawyers and magistrates had their routine of land transactions and debt collections interrupted when overseers herded gangs of newly delivered children into the courthouses to be scrutinized by the magistrates, whose task, a guessing game really, but one with money at stake, was to assign each child an age. When children reached 16, they became taxable, so the planters had an interest in low estimates. They were Africans, but they were human beings. Jefferson said so. He stood aghast at what he called this execrable commerce, this assemblage of horrors, a cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberties. Several years earlier, shielding his identity, he had submitted an emancipation bill to the Virginia House of Burgesses through a relative and heard his cousin denounced and belittled as someone who must hate America, an enemy of his country. Under his own name, on, as the revolution approached, Jefferson floated a more explicit plan, one that would truly have changed the course of our history if only the country, if only the country would stop the slave trade, Jefferson wrote. It could proceed to, quote, the enfranchisement of the slaves we have. Some enslaved families had been in America for generations, 
Jeff as I noted, Jefferson's own wife had six half-siblings who were slaves, people who were, quote, mighty near white. He sent this idea to the Burgesses in his summary view of the rights of British America. The Burgesses rejected it. He published it himself, but hardly anybody listened. So then, in his soaring, damning, fiery, transcendent Mozartian prose, he denounced the execrable commerce in his draft of the Declaration of Independence. But Congress crossed the passage out because South Carolina and Georgia, crying out for more slaves, could not hear any music in a prohibited market. But somewhere in a short span of years, in the late 1780s to the early 1790s, a transformation came over Jefferson. The historian David Bryan Davis writes, one cannot question the genuineness of Jefferson's liberal dreams. He was one of the first statesmen in any part of the world to advocate concrete measures for restricting and eradicating Negro slavery. But, Brian, Brian Davis continues, in the 1790s, the most remarkable thing about Jefferson's stand on slavery is his immense silence. And later, Davis finds Jefferson's emancipation efforts virtually ceased. It is a mystery at the heart of the founding. Um, oddly enough, I think we can begin to understand Jefferson's change uh, in France. Uh, when he went over as our minister plenipotentiary in 1785 to make commercial links with the, with the French, he carried in his head a vital statistic. More than one-third of all U.S. exports consisted of tobacco. He estimated the total annual value of all American exports at 80 million, and of this, he said, 30 million are constituted by tobacco. Not far behind tobacco was rice. Both crops were raised mainly by slaves. Now, at the time, we were uh, very deeply in debt to uh, Great Britain. A lot of Southerners hoped, uh, who, were, who were especially in debt to Britain, hoped that somehow, uh, if we won the revolution, that all those debts would be erased. Uh, but they weren't. They came back to haunt uh, the United States. And tobacco was one of the best, one of the, one of the chief ways we had of raising cash to, to pay off, uh, to slowly pay off our British uh, debts. Uh, and Jefferson, of course, as we all know, was, was one of the people who was very heavily um, in, indebted. Um, so, but Jefferson had uh, a problem. Uh, the, the French viewed us as an emerging nation with a human rights problem. We were not the great commercial entity that we are today. We had very little military and almost no naval power. We were, um, we were a paltry little nation, and Jefferson went there to beg for commercial uh, concessions from the French. Uh, the French were not entirely interested, um, but we had some powerful friends at court, people who had already supported us during the revolution. The, the uh, problem that Jefferson faced is that all of these people were staunch abolitionists uh, and who's, uh, who deeply believed in the ideals of the American Revolution, particularly in the ideal of universal liberty. And they looked to Jefferson as, as the man who most represented those ideals and as the man who would set in motion uh, an emancipation plan. Um, so, I mean, these people had a, almost a purer notion of human rights than, Je than Jefferson did. And so, in this context, we find Jefferson making some of his strongest uh, anti-slavery statements. If, for example, at one point he writes, you know that nobody wishes more ardently than I to, to see an abolition not only of the trade, but of the condition of slavery. And certainly nobody will be more willing to encounter every sacrifice for that object. Jefferson assured the French, in fact, that emancipation was, quote, gaining daily recruits among younger Americans. And he may have had his own daughter in mind in a note that, because Patsy was then with him uh, in France, hearing that a boatload of slaves was about to be delivered to Virginia, she heard this in France, she wrote to her father, good God, have we not enough? I wish with all my soul that the poor Negroes were all freed. Um, it, towards the end of his stay in France, Jefferson had an interesting dinner outside of, uh, of Paris with a group of people who pressed him on the subject of emancipation. Uh, and out of this came a really remarkable document. He, he received a letter from an Englishman, or American actually, named uh, Edward Bancroft, who wrote to him about this dinner. And he said, you talked about the condition of the slaves in America, and you talked about emancipation. Tell me what your recollections are. And Jefferson wrote this long letter, which is very often quoted and often cut in half, because the first half seems to contradict the second. In the first half, he talks about sort of the impossibility of freeing slaves. And he says, 
that to give liberty to, or rather to abandon persons whose habits have been formed in slavery is like abandoning children. It is one of his most forceful statements against the possibility of freeing slaves, uh, but actually it is the preamble to one of his most uh, imaginative uh, emancip to, to an emancipation plan. He writes, notwithstanding the discouraging results of earlier experiments, I am decided upon my final return to America to try this one. I shall endeavor to import as many Germans as I have grown slaves. I will settle them and my slaves on farms of 50 acres each intermingled and place, all, place them all on the footings of the metayers, that is the sharecroppers of Europe. Their children shall be brought up, as others are, in habits of property and foresight. And I have no doubt that they will be good citizens. Citizens, the soaring hope that you can feel in that, in that word. And uh, this is not the only reference Jefferson made to this plan. Sometime he also wrote to his private secretary, William Short, in great excitement about a plan involving German tenant farmers. He said, I have taken some measures for realizing a project which I have wished to execute for 20 years past without knowing how to go about it. Uh, so he returned from France to the United States, all to Virginia, all on fire with this idea that he might have found a way to end slavery. He was going to do something that actually George Washington also thought about doing, uh, acquiring small parcels of land somewhere and settling uh, blacks, uh, for, uh, slaves on it as tenant farmers to work them into the position of, of taking care of themselves and becoming sharecroppers. Well, a few years later, uh, a French duke, Duke de, de la rochefoucauld Liancourt, came to, to Monticello uh, on a visit. And this is another of, of a very famous um, incident and uh, you know, often quoted. And the, the duke arrived in the middle of the wheat harvest. And he said, I found him in the midst of the harvest from which the scorching heat of the sun does not prevent his intendance. He noted Jefferson's all-encompassing attentiveness to plantation management. He orders, directs, and pursues in the minutest detail every branch of business. Now, uh, he noticed also that the Negroes are nourished, clothed, and treated as well as white servants could be, and observing with some astonishment the multiplicity of enterprises that the slaves were carrying out. He's in the, the, the Duke writes, Every article is made on his farm. His Negroes are cabinet makers, carpenters, masons, bricklayers, smiths, etc. The children he employs in a nail factory, which yields already a considerable profit, and the young and old Negresses spin for the clothing of the rest. There is tremendous excitement in this. The Duke senses that what Jefferson had predicted in France has come to pass. The people whom Jefferson had described as children, unable to take care of themselves just a few years earlier, are now diligent, skilled, industrious workers who are, don't have to be animated by punishment but are animated by rewards. So obviously the, the, the moment has come to begin freeing the slaves and this comes up in conversation. Uh, and and you know, so they talk about this and so the, Duke, the question arises, is this the moment to set the people free? Apparently not. The Duke dutifully reports in his, in his uh, writings, the generous and enlightened Mr. Jefferson cannot but demonstrate a desire to see those Negroes uh, emancipated. But he sees so many, quote, he sees so many difficulties in their emancipation and he adds so many conditions to render it practicable that it is thus reduced to the impossible. Uh, and then he, he brings up the racial issue. He said that the, uh, Jefferson told him the Negroes of Virginia can only be emancipated all at once and by exporting to a distance the whole black race. He bases his opinion on the certain danger if there were nothing else of seeing blood mixed without means of preventing it. Now with this, an air of unreality settled over the scene because the Duke had noticed that, of course, Monticello, the household staff, is entirely made up of, almost entirely made up of mixed race people, and one whom one visitor said, who neither have neither in their color nor features a single trace of their African origin. So the objection that Jefferson raised has already been, I mean, the barrier has already been breached. Um, the people of Monticello and their skillfulness had already more than fulfilled the conditions that Jefferson had set down uh, in, in Paris, in, I mean, in France. The roster of skills was extraordinary. So what's wrong? Well, there were processes that were invisible to the Duke. The people who were gathering the sheaves and sharpening the sides in the hot sun of that Virginia afternoon would soon be owned in Amsterdam. 
Jefferson negotiated with the Dutch merchant banking house to finance the reconstruction of Monticello and the refinancing of his, of his debt. Uh, and so the people that, that the Duke saw working that afternoon were about to become assets bundled and collateralized in an international banking transaction with the Dutch banking house of, of Van Staphorst and, uh, and Hubbard. And the language says, whereas the said Van, Sta Van Staphorst and Hubbard have now lately and since the dates of the said deeds lent to the said Thomas the sum of $2,000 he hath given, granted, and conveyed unto the said Nicholas, etc., etc., the right and equity of redemption in the said 150 Negroes in, in full. So the Dutch bankers opened an equity line backed by Jefferson slaves for $2,000, uh, which helped in the reconstruction of Monticello. Uh, this continued in a, a pattern, actually, that Jefferson had begun a couple of years earlier. He was toting up the profits and losses um, of his plantation when he perceived a pattern at Monticello that what he, that he had ever never actually measured before. He proceeded to calculate it in a scribbled note in the middle of a page enclosed in brackets. What Jefferson realized for the first time was that he was making a 4% profit every year on the birth of black children. The enslaved people were yielding him a perpetual human dividend at compound interest. Jefferson wrote, quote, I allow nothing for losses by death, but on the contrary, shall presently take credit 4% per annum for their increase over and above keeping up their own numbers. The plantation was producing inexhaustible human assets at a predictable, uh, at a predictable percentage. Uh, a letter from the early 1790s takes this 4% formula even further. And Jefferson quite bluntly advances the notion that slavery presented the investment strategy for the future. He writes that an acquaintance who had suffered financial reverses, quote, should have been invested in Negroes. He advises that if the friend's family had any cash left, every farthing of it should be laid out in land and Negroes, which bring a silent profit of from 5 to 10% in this country by the increase in their value. Now, we might not grasp a world where a man can own his wife's half-siblings as slaves, but investments, markets, silent profit, this we can recognize. Now we are in a world we know. The irony is that Jefferson sent his 4% for, uh, formula letter to George Washington, who freed his slaves precisely because slavery had made human beings into money, quote, like cattle in the market, and Washington was disgusted. But Jefferson was, was right. The slaves had condemned themselves. The more skilled they became, the more valuable they became, and the more they tightened the chains of their enslavement. With the Monticello machine, as it was happening all across the Chesapeake, with these machines functioning in equilibrium, the owners would never dismantle them. The Duke was present for a transitional moment in American history. Like many other planters in the region, Jefferson was trying to devise a rational and humane plan for reforming slavery and bringing it into the new republic as an acceptable, indeed respectable, component of the economy and society. The slaveholders called it amelioration. Mainly a business plan, amelioration included a psychological component, persuading the slaves that it was rational and humane for them to be enslaved. This is what Jefferson, George Washington, and the other revolutionaries had most feared that the British would do to the white people of America, persuade them or trick them into submitting to a form of slavery that had invisible chains. The psychological underpinning of amelioration might be found, perversely, in the Declaration of Independence and Jefferson's sources for it. Jefferson wrote of a fearful apparition, quote, the sufferable evil, which he derived from John Locke's observation that people, quote, are more disposed to suffer than to right themselves by resistance. Jefferson rewrote this in the Declaration as, quote, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. If slaves could be convinced that it was in their interest to be good slaves, then they would not have to be collared or whipped, and slavery would become a less distasteful business for everyone involved. Benjamin Franklin, of all people, sketched out a remarkably calculating and cold program for manipulating people into internalizing their enslavement. Quote, Every master of slaves ought to know the slave's goodwill is his own. He bestows it where he pleases, and it is of some importance to the master's profit if he can obtain that goodwill at the cheap rate of a few kind words with fair and gentle usage. 
So kindness, fairness, gentleness, core human values become useful tools. Jefferson ran his system uh, with the help of people fatally rooted in old ways, clinging to conventions of loyalty and gratitude. He could depend on such people. They were tightly bound to him and their interests intersected. Everyone cherished order. For the owner, the maintenance of order kept the enterprise productive. For the slaves, order kept them alive and kept their families together. Uh, one person who I think exemplifies the way in which Jefferson himself imposed this, brought about this system of teaching peace to the conquered is, oddly enough, John Hemings. He's one of the most, justly so, one of the most celebrated of the enslaved artisans, enslaved people at Monticello because he was a superb woodworker. Um, he worked alongside Jefferson's Irish uh, joiner, James Dinsmore, uh, who was one of, the, one of the top cabinet makers and joiners um, in the country. And they together did all of the magnificent woodwork at, at, at Monticello. And unless I'm mistaken, if you go through Monticello today with, with one of the architectural historians, I don't think that they can say, well, this is the part that John did and this is the part that Dinsmore, that James Dinsmore did. It's all seamless. Um, but in Jefferson's treatment of John Hemings, we can see a psychological gulf opening up. And the gulf between whites and blacks is evident in Jefferson's dealings with Dinsmore and Hemings. Jefferson's letters to Dinsmore evince great respect. Jefferson wrote to him uh, on occasion, he, quote, he salutes him with esteem. On other occasions, Jefferson wrote, tender my esteem to Mr. Nelson, one of your white assistants, and be assured of it respectfully yourself. And on another occasion, I salute you both with friendship and respect. Even a, a hasty, dashed off note ends, accept my best wishes. Now, no such esteem is evident at all in Jefferson's many letters to Hemings. Elizabeth Langern, a Virginia historian, descended from Jefferson and never wanted to suggest that Jefferson did anything wrong, was compelled to note that, quote, Jefferson's letters to his key servant are businesslike, rather lacking in sentiment. Now, Hemings began doing productive work for Jefferson at age 14, but he was 34 before he drew a paycheck which Jefferson told Hemings was, quote, a gratuity or a donation, which in Jefferson's private records he acknowledged to be one month's pay for a year's work. What he wrote, the wages of one month in the year, which I allow him as, quote, an encouragement. Oh, but so along with this encouragement of Hemings, there was a diminishment of the man through a very careful calibration of recognition. Jefferson received the services of a, of a top cabinet maker for $20 a year, plus food. What did slavery cost the slave? Let us imagine for a moment that John Hemings was white and free. What would his services have earned him in the open market in, in central Virginia? When John Hemings was doing the fine woodwork at Poplar Forest, woodwork that a Monticello curator has called, quote, incredible, the white carpenter John Perry was doing lesser tasks, structural work, and a wood floor. Hemings was by far the better craftsman, but Perry reaped the rewards on the marketplace open to, open to whites. Um, he, uh, his work on buildings and churches in Albemarle and counties around there enabled him to purchase large amounts of land, part of which he sold to the University of Virginia. Another Monticello joiner, James Oldham, another white man, earned enough money to open a public house. Now, only uh, Hemings belonged to actually to a very tiny minority of slaves at Monticello who received a share of the profits or what Jefferson called gratuities. The rest of them, in truth, were animated by fear, by fear of the overseers. Jefferson himself acknowledged this. Writing about an enslaved girl who was not performing well in the textile mill, Jefferson said, quote, I've given her notice that she shall have some day's trial more. And if there is no improvement, she must cease to spoil cloth and go out to work with the overseer. It's interesting, George Washington used the same language um, in the same tone to threaten slaves who worked in the household. Said, Look, if you don't shape up, I'm going to send you out into the field with the overseers as a common co-worker. Now, Jefferson hated conflict, and he disliked having to punish people. And a fog of regret and of denial hung over the whole business. But the people had to cooperate one way or another. Throughout his plantation records, there runs the thread of indications, some direct, some oblique, some in euphemisms, that the Monticello machine operated on carefully calibrated violence. Some people would never readily submit to being slaves. Some people, Jefferson wrote, quote, 
require a vigor of discipline to make them do reasonable work. Jefferson said, my first wish is that the laborers may be well treated, which is something that we often see quoted. And what appears at first glance to be an ironclad declaration of principle turns out to be just what Jefferson says it is, a wish, and it has a qualifier. The second wish is that, quote, they may enable me to have that treatment continued by making as much as will admit it. The translation of this is, I wish to treat you well, but if you do not produce enough, there will be harsh measures. Jefferson's overseer, William Page, for example, evoked disgust in the area. His methods of control at Jefferson's farms unnerved the county. In the judgment of Albemarle's white citizens, Page was, quote, was, quote a terror. Jefferson's son-in-law, Colonel uh, Thomas Mann Randolph, who managed Monticello for him, uh, informed Jefferson of the slaves' discontent at Page's free use of the lash, but Jefferson retained that overseer's services for another two years. Uh, his son-in-law, John Wales Epps, alluded to the public sentiment against that man. When Epps sought to hire slaves from other Albemarle planters, nobody would do business with him. Quote, the terror of Page's name prevented the possibility of hiring them. Now, in the 1950s, a small fragment of information about the Monticello system so shocked one of Jefferson's editors that he suppressed it from the record. Until recently, the standard source for our understanding of life at Monticello has been the edition of Jefferson's farm book edited in the early 1950s by Edwin Betts. Now, when Betts edited one of Colonel Randolph's plantation reports to uh, Jefferson, he confronted a taboo. Randolph reported to Jefferson that the nailery was functioning very well because, quote, the small ones were being whipped. Being 10, 11, or 12 years old, they did not take willingly to being forced to show up in the, before dawn in Mr. Jefferson's nail forge. And so the overseer, Gabriel Lilly, was whipping them, quote, for truancy. Now, Betts decided that the image of children being beaten at Monticello had to be suppressed, and the full text did not emerge until 2005. But Betts' deletion played an important part in shaping almost all the scholarship about Jefferson uh, outside of that at Monticello. Uh, that, uh, about the way that Jefferson managed his plantation. Um, this fellow, Lilly, uh, was exceptionally cruel. Uh, at one point, when one of the Hemingses was very ill and was, had taken refuge and to recover in the home of, of Oldham, this other white worker, um, Lilly would not have none of it. He just wanted to keep productivity up, so he sought out Hemings and as in Oldham's report to Jefferson, you know, beat him so so severely that he almost disabled him, and he called it a barbarity. Uh, and yet Jefferson kept this man on, and in fact he gave him he gave him a share of the of the profits of the nailery, and productivity immediately soared. And when uh, Lilly uh, approached Jefferson about having his salary increased, Jefferson was in was in a uh, a, a quandary. Uh, because he didn't want, he couldn't, he felt he couldn't afford to pay this man anymore, at least he didn't want to, but he said that he was as good a man as you could get and he answered his purposes exactly. So all of the cruelty that Lilly had carried out really uh, did, did not bother him. Um, and Colonel Randolph is an interesting figure. He was the intermediary, he was the go between. When Jefferson was away, um, uh, as, as uh, in, in Philadelphia or Washington, or, uh, that Colonel Randolph was the one who had to keep things running. And then later his daughter, I mean his wife Martha did, and then later uh, Colonel Randolph's son, Jeff Randolph, was the intermediary. Uh, Randolph, Colonel Randolph made an interesting, there's an interesting letter that he wrote after a slave at an adjoining plantation, not one of Mr. Jefferson's, but another one, uh, hung, hanged himself after being whipped. And Randolph said that this man, this had been a man of exceptional character, uh, and he had done everything he could to avoid being punished. But he'd committed some trivial offense, and so the overseer decided to give him a whipping, and he was so humiliated that he hanged himself on, on a tree very, in very close view to the master's house, so the master would know what his regime had done. And in that letter, Randolph said that our southern system is a hideous monster. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't mince words, and he, and he just denounced the whole thing. Uh, and he said that he himself had given up the use of the whip, but of course the whip still remained um, in, in use at Monticello. Uh, the word to which every writer on slavery must eventually resort is irony. Jefferson put down his 4% formula in a letter to George Washington. The irony, of course, is that Washington was, at, even at that time, turning in his mind plans for freeing his slaves, which he would eventually do in his will, uh, 
after his family had thwarted an earlier effort. On the issue of slavery, Jefferson emerges, emerges poorly in a side-by-side -side moral comparison against Washington. But in hindsight, we can see which founder more truly reflects the times and the character of the country. The public took little note and did not long remember Washington's emancipation of his slaves. In hindsight, George Washington's inflexible sense of justice, that's how uh, Jefferson described it, and his insistence on a common bond of principle seem antique, dull and disapproving as his portrait on the dollar. When you set them beside the ingenuity, the vision, and the entrepreneurial energy that Jefferson displayed at Monticello. A startling statistic emerged in the 1970s when economists took a hard-headed look at slavery. They found that on the eve of the Civil War, enslaved black people in the aggregate formed the second most valuable capital asset in the United States. Summer, summing up the, all the research, David Bryan Davis wrote, in 1860, the value of Southern slaves was about three times the amount invested in manufacturing or railroads combined. The only asset more valuable than the black people was the land itself. So the formula that Jefferson had stumbled upon became the engine not only of Monticello, but of the entire slaveholding South and the Northern industries, shippers, banks, insurers, and investors who weighed risk against returns and bet on slavery. The words that Jefferson used, their increase became magic words. So the future, for a while at least, belonged to Jefferson. And I will stop there and take any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. I think a microphone is going around. Henry, is there any chance that Jefferson actually didn't know what Lilly was doing, or is that uh, sort of like the Pakistani government not knowing that Osama bin Laden was there? No, he, uh, uh, Oldham, the other white, uh, the white worker with whom Hemings was staying, wrote a report, a full report about the incident to, uh, to Lilly, I mean to Jefferson. Uh, and his son-in-law, Colonel Randolph, wrote to uh, Jefferson that Lilly was whipping the small ones to get them to work in the morning. So he knew all about it. Uh, at, the, at the time of Jefferson's death, uh, were uh, his slaves owned by uh, Dutch and other foreign concerns more than uh, domestic? He may have paid off that Dutch debt by then. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I, that's something I'm going to nail down in one of my footnotes, but I'm not, not exactly sure. He, he, he died indebted, uh, it, it, correct? Yes, oh yeah, $107,000. Uh, and and, uh, collateral was his house and his everything, or, or just principally his slaves? No, the, the collateral, by that time, the collateral was everything. Okay. Yeah. Just, just besides uh, him writing about slaves as uh, or likening them to children, can you quote anything else that he said about slaves' inferiority that he published, that he wrote? Because well, I his most famous statements things. about the inferiority of slaves are in his uh, notes on the state of Virginia. And that's actually online. So you can, um, uh, you can just do a Google search for uh, Jefferson notes on the state of Virginia, and you can find his statements on the inferiority of slaves. Actually uh, it's have, actually something I have that he the backed. Book, but I, was I have that book, but I was wondering if you could say for the audience anything else that he, uh, he has written. Uh, aside from, from notes? Yeah. Well, at one, he, a British uh, traveler quoted him as saying that, uh, that they were like mules made only to carry burthens. Um, and I mean, off the top of my head, I, I can't think of, uh, of anything else, but I know there are, are, are others, but the most famous one is, note, is in Notes on the State of Virginia. Um, later on, he said that, you know, even if a pe people are inferior, that's no measure of their rights. Um, and he said, uh, you know, that, that, that they still had full rights as human beings, even if they might be inferior. But that, that was later on. 
Oh, wait one second. She's good. She in, in your opinion, uh, in view of the fact that the land was free and the slaves uh, were an advantage, economic advantage, why did Jefferson die insolvent? Oh, he spent recklessly. Uh, I mean, it, it's funny. I mean, debt, he was in debt for his whole adult life, but debt never bothered him really until the end. I mean, when you think... That I mean, he complained about it all the time, uh, but he was a genius at refinancing. He was always juggling his debts, refinancing, looking for, and, and he denounced banks, but he was one of the first customers when the banks opened. Uh, and I'm not trying to make, make fun of him. I'm just trying to take a realistic view at, at <coughs> what he did. Uh, but when you consider that he built Monticello twice, and that when he f was sort of, when he was finished building Monticello, he built Poplar Forest, and then he invested somewhere between ten dollars and $20,000 in building a mill and a canal at, at Milton. You can see that debt never really stopped him. I mean, he complained about it, but it never restrained him from, from doing what he, what he wanted to do. Uh, and of course, in his private life, he, he, he spent very well. I mean, I think the week before he died, he ordered another case of wine. Um, and when he was supposedly struggling with his debts, he ordered a very expensive uh, forte piano for his daughter. Uh, he, he was always looking towards the future. I mean, he always, he, he was certain that he would wor work his way out of it. And it wasn't until he signed a note for a relative for $20,000 towards the end of his life that the roof really did fall in. Uh, he, he thought that he could manage all of these debts. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate the, especially the economic uh, dimension to to his change of thinking, I guess, about what slavery is, how bad it is. I really have a, more of a comment than a question. Mm -hmm. Is uh, I understand that one big influence, or some people say, uh, on, on Jefferson and changing his mind about slavery was the social pressure from other, other slave owners. And he was afraid to, uh, to I guess, appear that different. And, uh, and then, as you know better than I, I'm sure, the, this Polish general left him enough money. Yes, Kostruszko. Yeah, and uh, apparently to free the slaves. Right. And he agreed, even, he even helped him write up his will. Yes. Here in the U.S. Right. And he agreed verbally and all that, but then he, then he did not come through with that. That's, that, that is a, a very interesting uh, incident. I mean, I think it was 1795 when Kostruszko was leaving the United States uh, he was finally paid for his service in the Revolution, uh, and he had some cash and some bonds and some stock, and he, he sat down with Jefferson and wrote out a will in which he, he left this money to uh, Jefferson to, f to purchase and free as many uh, Monticello slaves as, as, that, as, the, as, the, as that money would purchase, and to provide them with land and equipment and, and training uh, you know, to set themselves up as, as free people. Uh, so when Kosciuszko finally died some 20 years later, the will went into effect, and Jefferson was the executor. And he ran away from it as fast as he could. And I wondered, well, why? Because, well, here is somewhere between seventeen dollars and $20,000, which would have really helped a lot to, you know, with, with his debt situation. And it was a time when the economy was in, uh, was in a depression. Why didn't he take that money? Uh, and when you, when, you, when you look at the will, you realize that probably about half the money would in, a se would in effect go to the slaves themselves because they would, they would have to be, uh, land would have to be purchased for them. They would have to have livestock and equipment. So a, a, you know, a, lot, a lot of that money would, would go to expenses. Uh, the people who were most qualified to be freed under the ter terms of that will were precisely the people who were most important to the Monticello machine. I mean, and the artisans, I mean, uh, the you know, carpenters or the best farmers or the blacksmiths, the, the people who were most in a position to support themselves. And so these were the people that Jefferson really least wanted to let go of. Um, and at the same time, unfortunately, Jefferson was thinking about the capital value of, of the families that he had at, at Monticello in that he said that the addition, the breeding woman who brings a child every two years is more profitable to me than anyone else because what she gives me is an addition to my capital. Uh, he was still counting the babies. Uh, 
Uh, and so why give, why give up families who are producing assets for him when he, in the end, he wouldn't be getting that much cash out of the deal? So he But he why declined. did he change his mind, you think? Why? Well, why did he agree to it initially and then change his mind? Well, the, he agreed to it. It was in the 1790s, and he was sort of on the downslide of, the, of his revolutionary fervor. I mean, your, your earlier point about Jefferson feeling a kind of peer pressure uh, is, is true. But there's another, there is another uh, factor involved, and one is um, what, what the historian David Bryan Davis calls revolutionary time. Uh, in that it's a revolutionary time is a window in which everyone is whipped up with the with idealistic fervor and people believe that things can be done and so that's that's when I mean for example Washington George Washington was, Washington was integrating uh, the United States Army uh, and there were emancipation plans being tossed about back and forth uh, and everybody was uh, not everybody some uh, a small number of influential people thought that now the time has come to free the slaves. And then once the revolution was over and things begin to settle down, that fervor begins to deflate. Um, Jefferson's fervor, I think, was pumped up because he spent so much time in France where the revolutionary ideals really were, ke were, were kept alive. And then when he got, the first thing he, that happens to him when he gets back to Virginia after his time in France, his daughter Patsy falls in love with cousin Thomas Mann Randolph and she needs a dowry. And what's he going to give her? Slaves. So he then ends up passing slavery into the next generation. And Patsy's uh, anti-slavery feelings evaporate also. But anyway, we've got to get on to other. Um, actually, yeah. uh, this may be connected to the, what you were just talking about. Uh, did, did the, as Jefferson's indifference to the slaves grew and indifference to the problem of slavery grow, did he alter his ideals for democracy? I mean, did he believe, come to feel that democracy itself was a impractical or not something that he really believed. Oh no, I don't. I don't think that um, he no. didn't see those as he didn't see it as contradictory. No, okay. no. I mean, um, no. I think he well. He saw slavery as being the engine that would that would uh, spread uh, the republic across the country. I mean, that's why he did, thought it was a good thing to put slaves in the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, you know, he wanted to see the slave system expanded. He thought it would be, you know, good for our way, for the way of life that we had. So. Uh, yes, you're, um, I think your book on George Washington left us feeling more positive about Washington. Uh, uh, this book, this presentation certainly makes me feel much less positive about Jefferson. So is, is that an accurate characterization? But then my real question is, <laughs> Is George, is George with a figure in this story? Is, is any part of, of Jefferson's anti-slavery enthusiasm uh, something that he, he takes from with? It, it might have been. I mean, with, with is just going to be, I think, a, f a footnote um, in, in, my, in my book. I'm not going to go into him in any, in any great depth. Um, but uh, in, in response to what you said, uh, let me read something that I decided to leave out at the last minute. Um, the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr writes that Americans, quote, have the greatest difficulty in dealing with the moral ambiguities of the political and social order. Uh, you brought up a very good point. Um, we tend to think in absolutes, and when we hit something that kind of threatens, or I mean, where is it? Parton, who's, he, who, who he wrote the formula: if Jefferson was wrong, America was wrong. You know, if Jefferson was right, America is right. So. That's the way that we, that we think. And, and, and Niebuhr, who is in, you know, tremendously popular these days, says, you know, we, we, we need to be able to deal with these moral ambiguities. And he says, uh, maybe I, 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 I cut it out, but he talks about how when we hit something we don't like, we go into these moral funks. And it's like, it's like we've hit something that doesn't compute. Uh, and because you know, we have a strong belief in our own innocence. I mean, that's the funny thing about this country. We have to believe that everything we do is good and that um, we, we, and we will do everything we can to keep the founding as pure and as innocent as possible. And I think that's why, first of all, there was so much resistance to the idea of Jefferson having children with, with Sally Hemings. I mean, it was ferocious resistance. And now I think that we're, we may, you know, we need to get a clearer idea of what slavery was really like um, back then, because I think we have to lose this idea that we came from completely innocent origins. I mean, it's a, it's a myth. It's a, it's a complete fabrication. 
Well, thank you for your presentation. I found it extremely illuminating. I come from a family of uh, uh, ancestry, uh, many slave owners, and I've often pondered sort of what was the thinking that was, uh, that was going on there. The, the explanations I tend, tend to receive up till now had to do with sort of a momentum. Well, slavery had been happening throughout history and it just sort of continued, uh, right. uh, came on. And instead you're saying, well, there's a calculus, you know, we could stop this, but look what it would cost, you know. Uh, we can calculate it down to a 4% uh, compounded return. Uh, you know, money talks, and uh, it's very much in terms of uh, a type of thinking that uh, I engage in every day as I you know, examine my 401k or, or, or whatever. And, and so to me, well, yeah, it, it, it really, uh, I, I felt that uh, what you'd done was really help me connect very much with this ancestry that I uh, puzzle with a good bit. And, to, and I think to help clarify the thinking uh, that uh, must have been going on uh, in these parts. And I can see that in, in the way that I was raised and, right. a lot of, and a lot of the advice I was given uh, in terms of how we would relate to people that worked for us that were black, mm -hmm. and that we wanted to ingratiate them, but, make sh but, but we didn't really want to advance. You know, it wasn't, had, didn't have anything to do with their advancement. Uh, right. And, and the strategies uh, that you mentioned that uh, I think you said uh, Ben Franklin uh, suggested right. were very much uh, a part of my upbringing. Right. And Be so kind really, and then you can, you can yeah. purchase their goodwill. But to go back right. to your earlier point about the momentum of slavery and how it had come back, come from the past, and you know, it also had the, the biblical approvals and all that, that hit a great big speed bump with the revolution. Uh, Jefferson himself acknowledged that later in life in his autobiography. He said before the revolution, people looked upon slaves more or less as they did their livestock. But the revolution changed all of that. Um, and uh, that's something David Brian Davis writes about if you wanted to look at, at, his, uh, at, at his books, especially the problem of slavery in the age of revolution. I mean, he, uh, it was first, slavery first began to be questioned by, um, by Quakers and then later by Baptists and Methodists. And then during the revolution, in the revolutionary era, it came under fierce criticism. Um, and then that, that, that all of that began to, to subside as, after we won the revolution and then the, you know, the, the, the business went back to being business. Uh, and the old, and I, just, I'll finish this off briefly, I mean the old myth that we were all taught in school was that slavery was dying during the revolution and would have died except for the invention of the cotton gin. But way back in, in the 1970s, a historian named Robert McCauley wrote a book called Slavery and Jeffersonian Virginia, in which he said, no, the, the age when, je when slavery was supposedly collapsing was the age of its greatest expansion. Uh, and when you look at the numbers, that's when and thousands of slaves were being moved from the washed out lands in the Tidewater to the west, to the Piedmont. That's when Kentucky was being opened. And that's when the lands in southwest Virginia were being settled, and the lands in uh, places like Stokes County and Davie County and Forsyth County in, um, uh, in North Carolina. That the Bright Belt uh, in, in the, of tobacco land, the best tobacco growing land in the world. Um, that was all being settled in the revolutionary uh, era. So slaves were already being transferred and that's when people began to realize that slaves made excellent portable, you know, portable uh, wealth. Uh, and that uh, you know, w this is one of the things Washington complained about. Um, when his nephew wrote to him about moving to Kentucky and, and selling his slaves in, you know, should I sell my slaves in, in Virginia or in Kentucky? Uh, you know, because there was already a lively market going on. But. Hi, Henry. Hi, Cinder. <laughs> uh, I think we'll have many discussions after this, but I hope in your book that you uh, talk about Jefferson's side of the Gabriel Lilly story, his letter uh, writing to make sure that Lilly does not whip the boys in the nailery, uh, saying that he wants them to be encouraged by the stimulus of character. Right. He's speaking in the same words. You sort of compared Jefferson uh, to Thomas Mann Randolph, and and really they're talking the same language about treating the enslaved people as human beings <coughs> and uh, appealing to their character. But that one letter has has the whole entanglement in it, as right. you know, because right. he talks about they would be more valuable then. Um, right. If if they were encouraged by character, right. but 
Jefferson, you know, I think you um, put him too much in, uh, on the wrong side of things in the lily well, today, but yeah, maybe today. Yeah, today. Yeah, I, uh, I am t today. I gave you the gave the short version in the, in the book. I have a longer examination of it, and but I still think that it doesn't. I, that letter doesn't speak all that well of Jefferson. I think that if you read it in a certain way, superficially, because what what the letter says, uh, Jefferson. All right, the letter was written in January. Jefferson had been at Monticello in December, watching Lilly at work, in the, you know, not in the nailery, but in the fields. And my take is that, and Jefferson never liked to confront anybody about, anybody about things like this, and he loved to work through intermediaries. So I think that he had seen Lilly doing things in the fields that he didn't like. So he wrote to Colonel Randolph and said, I forgot to speak to you about the matter of Lilly and the nailers. So I think that, what, what the implication there, and I'm not sure about this, and you and I can talk about it, is that Jefferson was saying it's okay for him to wield the whip out in the field with the older people who are used to it. I don't want him beating up on the nail boys because, first of all, there are Hemingses in there, and second of all, they're, you know, they're on the young side. But in the, in, in the postscript, Colonel Randolph writes back, I told Lily, you know, to go easy on the nailers, and nobody's being whipped except the small ones for truancy. So, and Jefferson leaves it at that, that he doesn't write back and saying, don't whip anybody. I, I, don't, I don't know that postscript, so I can't respond. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, maybe you're remembering the version that's in Betts. Maybe. Because, that's, that's because the letter. I'll, I'll tell you, when I wrote, when I read, I read that, that version in Betts, which everybody quotes, McLaughlin quotes it, um, Ellis quotes it, it and it's the, the strongest evidence that Jefferson restrained his overseers from beating people. Well, when, the, when that letter was published in the Jefferson papers, the new edition, like magic, there was a new line at the end. And I couldn't believe my eyes. I looked, I compared the two versions. It's not there in Betts. He deleted it. He suppressed it. So I wrote to the Historical Society in Boston, and I said, do you have the original of this letter? And they sent me a copy. And it's, you know, it's right there. Betts just wouldn't publish it. So take a look at the Jefferson Papers version, and it, it's, it's, all, it's all new. I mean, I mean it, when I read that, it was like the foundation shook. I said, now, I mean, I, so if you can't even believe the documents that are in print, what can you believe? And the other thing that, that shook me was when I found that nobody, to my knowledge, ever quoted that 4% theorem. I've never, never seen it quoted. I've looked through all the books on Jefferson and slavery, and there's no reference to it. Uh, and I think, well, this is the underpinning of the whole thing. This is, th this is how he was financing everything. Uh, but no one talks about it. So anyway. Oh, hold on, Lynn. The, you'll wait, for the, we have a, wait for the mic. No, I'm I don't want to make this sound like I'm defending slavery or Jefferson, uh, but I think it helps us understand a little bit of uh, how it could have gone on. Uh, three years ago, the United Nations uh, ended a, a very extensive worldwide report and, and published it and said that there are 27 million slaves in the world now, 19,000 in the United States. Uh, the same year the Smithsonian Magazine published uh, their feature article was about uh, 10,000 slaves in Niger. Mm -hmm. uh, some of whom have been slaves for 400 years. So, and a lot of the products that we use are produced by slavery that we Americans use. So how can we take that lesson from what you've talked about today mm -hmm. uh, and apply it now since slavery is still going on on a large scale? Oh, well, obviously we should try to get rid of, I mean, eradicate slavery wherever, wherever it exists. I mean, it also shows how attractive slavery is as an economic system. Um, I, every now and then I see discussions on the internet saying, well, you know, white people weren't the only ones who had slaves. You know, black people had slaves too. And my response is, is well, yeah, it just shows you how attractive a system it was. I mean, it, that it, it transcended racial lines uh, and that anybody could be corrupted by it. It was very seductive. Um, Lynn, do you have a question? The woman here in the purple. Oh, did you want to? Um, you spoke about the moral ambiguity 
relative to Jefferson and the slaves and your confusion. I, I guess I would also say it seems there's moral ambiguity in a man who leaves his family destitute and at the same time when he ran it, when he was president of the United States was excellent at being a deficit hawk and managing the country's money. So um, my question is, uh, to what extent do historians have um, a responsibility to make us feel comfortable with moral ambiguity? Ooh. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, well, you know, we don't like it. I mean, we like things clear cut. Um, I th no, I think that there, we, we do, I mean, people who write about history, I think, I'm not, I don't want to tell anybody else what to do, you know, I mean, and to be honest with you, I didn't get into writing about Jefferson because I felt like driving myself crazy and felt like <laughs> discovering all this. Um, I actually thought that it would be a far different book. Uh, I had a sense that, that Jefferson was a man who was, I sort of, I absorbed all the usual assumptions, that Jefferson was a man who was really mired in this antique 18th century racial philosophy, that in a way that he helped to construct, but he was also ensnared in, um, and that he could never really get out of it, and that his, his racism was is sad, but it was profound and it was defining, and we have to judge the man in his own terms, in his own time, and you know, that was that. And so my book would take off from that understanding of Jefferson and talk about how the slaves struggled against that. Um, but then I found this level of awareness, deliberateness, calculation in the financial records that truly shocked me. And this brought out, I mean, it, it, it first of all, it was a paralyzing uh, discovery because it overturned all everything that I thought about Jefferson. And it was very comforting to think that he didn't know what he was doing, that he, that he had the innocence of his racism. That, uh, but, um, you know, the, the, the other, the ambiguity that it also led me toward is that, you know, once he had decided that these people were in some way either just inferior or just different, that gave him a license to do all kinds of things. They could be bought, they could be sold. Uh, their families could be broken up. Uh, I mean, the, I don't want to go into any more, you know, any detail, but um, it, it, he felt liberated by that in a way because he thought, you know what, the, uh, their griefs are transient, he wrote in Notes on the State of Virginia. Uh, he said, you know, they'll, they'll get over it. Um, so, anyway, but that you raise a very, very powerful question. Uh, Kristen? Okay. Oh, oh, oh. Couple more questions. Okay, we, it, and then we'll let you go. Want to hand it over to Chris. Thanks, Henry. Um, I have a question uh, that relates to this larger I, package deal of Jefferson and slavery. Slavery really means a lot of different things. It means the international slave trade. It means the domestic slave trade. It means diffusion. It means colonization. It means slavery on a local level at Monticello. When you talk about Jefferson. So I'm wondering how your book takes all those strands, puts them together maybe or not, and helps us understand how the, all of those things interact. Because all of those things are a component of Jefferson and slavery. Right, uh, that's, that, that's an excellent question. One point I want to bring up in the book is that there were um, different micro, micro climates of slavery just at Monticello. And that the mountaintop, the summit, Mulberry Row up to the top, uh, was a microclimate of its own. Most of those people, we call them slaves, but you could also say this is where Jefferson's black family lived. Uh, they were all related, most of them were related to him through his wife. Well, he does use plantation and slavery as interchangeable terms. Um, well, well, we'll have to talk about that okay. later. But I think one of the points I want to make is that when you get farther down the mountain, things get very different and things get, uh, get harsher. And that's where... The, you know, the, and when you get across the river and you start beginning to deal with people like Page. And when you get to Poplar Forest, where I think things were a lot worse and where his relative, uh, I can't think of, Elizabeth Trist said, I fear the poor Negroes fear hard. I wish they were treated as well there as they are in Mr. Turnalon's place. And Mr. Turnalon's place was in Louisiana. It was a sugarcane plantation. 
So I think things were really rough at Poplar Forest. Um, and so there are different microclimates. Um, and, you know, I, I want to emphasize, you know, Jefferson didn't like the idea that it was a cruel system, but he had ways of distancing himself from it. One of them was that he was surrounded by this cordon sanitaire of Hemings's, people who were very white, who were uh, literate, uh, you know, who had been brought who were trained and well-dressed and, you know, ser and, and were wonderful servants. Those were the people that he saw most of the time. Um, and then in the evenings he went out and he worked with his mechanics, doing what, I don't know. But I don't think he spent much time with the people at Site 8. Um, you know, uh, they, so he didn't, he didn't know and he didn't care what was going on down there. Mm -hmm. So, but we can talk about this later. Um, did you already have a question, Barkley? Yeah, All right, one, 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 more. one more? Just one more. Well, give it to Bar Barkley then, oh, because nobody. he's persistent. Okay. <laughs> Here you go, just pass that forward, please. Thank you. Uh, I think your question was great. Uh, what uh, is, is it the job of historians to make us comfortable with ambiguity? And I, I think it, it is absolutely your job, which you have gone in a mission where uh, angels fear to tread. But, and I think that the words of Jefferson in the statute for religious freedom, uh, that truth is great and if left to herself, will prevail. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Barkley. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll just close with one, one remark. I got, in a way, I got trained for this book, doing the, the, the Hairston's book, um, which was extremely painful because I was dealing with the descendants on both sides. And I remember the time when, towards the end of the composition of the book, I had to, I had to drive down to North Carolina sort of one more time to confront Judge Peter Hairston who had been my chief advocate and, and source on the question of whether his grandfather had had children with, with the house servants. And he continued absolutely to deny it. And then I went over to see the black part of the family, and even they denied it. And I put it, so I put it into the book as something that probably didn't happen. I knew in my heart that it had, and that they just didn't want to talk about it. And since then, I mean, I was just down in North Carolina a couple of weeks ago. I was invited down to give a talk in, to a whole room full of this, bigger than this, of, of Hairston's who came out to, to hear about the book. And people came up to me with information that nobody would give me 15 years ago about all of the blood connections between those, you know, those two families. Uh, but, I re but I remember that day when I was driving down to see the judge and as a, uh, making that four hour drive to North Carolina, Ike was feeling sicker and sicker and sicker the way, all the way down. And I said, I, this is, I do not want to have this conversation. I don't want to know this, but I have to find out. Not because I want to, but because I think it should be in, in the book. Um, and the evidence for it was right there in a portrait on the wall, photographs, look at the resemblance. Everybody denied it. Um, so in a way, I felt relieved that I could put their denial in the, in the book. It was sort of easier to deal with. Um, but um, anyway, it's, it's a really, talking about moral ambiguity, it is a hard, hard history. Uh, and you know what, we really, I don't, I'm not going to lecture anybody. I mean, I don't like to face it. Um, and I think for people to come from those families, especially from those, from the families of, of the enslaved, it must be really, really hard. I mean, uh, and I'll stop with this. One woman came up to me and said, I can't read the book about, you wrote about my family. I cannot bear the idea that my people were slaves. Um, so, anyway. I'll stop there. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Bill. Thank you.